Go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of 2 Chronicles. The book of 2 Chronicles. We'll be reading in just a moment from chapter 36, and we'll uh, begin in verse 11. Again, 2 Chronicles 36, 11. The church has been blessed to make this accurate confession for 2,000 years. And they confess this with great joy. That is, He is not here, He has risen. The reason that we gather on Easter Sunday, on Resurrection Sunday, I think would be the better name for it, but the reason we gather on Easter and each and every other Sunday is because of the fact that He has indeed been raised from the grave. If that is not true, we should go home. We should not waste our time with all of the things that we might do in here because none of it will matter. But it does matter because of the great truth. And as Drew said, we, we dramatize this with this, this great privilege of baptizing these young people as a part of our service today. And what a beautiful picture. Buried. Jesus was buried because he died in atonement for our sin. And he was raised to demonstrate his victory over both sin and death. And in the act of baptism, we identify with him publicly as our Lord and Savior. To God be the glory alone. Somebody texted me this this morning. I, I had seen it before, but I thought, well, this, this is really true. Not only is the tomb empty, and it is, but the throne is occupied. That is true. And we rejoice in both. Now, if you're new here, if you're visiting, you're going to think, what a strange place, what a strange text to preach an Easter sermon from. The book of Second Chronicles that deals essentially with the demise, with the fall of ancient Judah. But as we have argued, not only from the beginning of this sermon series, but from the beginning of my service here as the pastor of what was then Centercrest, now North Clay Baptist Church, that every passage of Scripture, every book of the Bible, every verse in the Bible is a testimony pointing to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we want to see uh, Jesus as the very theme, as the very purpose for every book of the Bible. And we will today. Now, you've heard me say many times that I enjoy, I, I love the special days that we celebrate in the church, primarily uh, the Christmas season and the Easter season. Uh, at Christmas, we celebrate, we proclaim the incarnation of our Savior. Uh, at Easter, we proclaim the resurrection of our Savior, and rightly so, but the difficulty for me many times is that we do that each and every Sunday. That, that, that it, it's hard to make the difference sometimes. And I, I, I'm not arguing for some, uh, some kind of bland approach uh, to the proclamation of the Word of God on any given Sunday. I'm simply saying that we as the people of God are constantly confessing the great truth that He is alive, He has arisen from the grave, and we confess it, we proclaim it, and we celebrate it each and every Sunday. In fact, I would suggest to you that every time that you open the Word of God, I'll even go further. Every time you open your eyes, indeed, we can, should confess the greatness of our resurrected Savior. So we're going to continue today this sermon series that we call uh, Route 66, and we're going to stop uh, here at Second 
Chronicles. So read with me, if you will, beginning in verse 11 of chapter 36. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. He stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord, the God of Israel. All of the officers of the priest and the people, likewise, were exceedingly unfaithful, following all the abominations of the nations. And they polluted the house of the Lord that he had made holy in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no remedy. Therefore, he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or aged. He gave them all into his hand. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of his princes, and all these he brought to Babylon, and they burned the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem and burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its precious vessels. He took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put in, it in writing, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. Pray with me, if you will, this morning. Father, once again, we thank you for your truth, for your word, for your testimony that begins all the way in the book of Genesis and continues all the way the close of the book of Revelation, this great testimony to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. May we always rightly divide this word for the sake of seeing Jesus as indeed the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and the one hope for all who would be saved. Bless us as we study today. We thank you that we can confess with confidence that indeed he isn't here. He has risen indeed. Lord, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this particular book, I will remind you, was originally part of what we preached last week, that being namely First Chronicles. So, uh, the book was divided into two books, and so we pick up here. The time frame of the events described is probably about 970 B.C., the, which tells us about the ascent, the succession of Solomon to the throne of his father, David. And so the book of Second Chronicles takes us from this ascent of Solomon and through this edict that we just mentioned uh, by Cyrus, the king of Persia, which came at the end of the prophesied and aptly warned against 70 years of captivity and continues all the way till 539 B.C. And probably the writer, which probably the priest 
Ezra, the priest of the return of the restoration that I uh, mentioned last week, he probably had a great deal to do with what we have now as First and Second Chronicles. He may not have put the finishing touches on it, but I believe much of the information probably should be credited uh, to this good and godly uh, priest. The thing that's important to us is that we're confident that God, through His Holy Spirit, inspired these men of old to write with complete accuracy and complete confidence that which He revealed to them, and we have it for our benefit here today. Again, as a testimony, not only that our God is the sovereign Lord of all history, and He is. He is the Father of our Savior Jesus Christ, who is the point of the entirety of the testimony. And so we have really what amounts here in First and Second Chronicles, an account, a second account of the rise and fall of what might be called the Davidic kingdom. As I mentioned last week, we have it here because God compelled, God inspired the author of these books to write a word that was uh, relevant and pertinent to those that were returning from the 70 years of exile, this uh, Babylonian captivity. They were get, being permitted to return to Jerusalem. And so the writer wrote to inform this generation, uh, to instruct them, uh, to warn them, and to remind them of the faithfulness of God. And so they have this word as to, now that you have been given the great privilege of returning to this land that was once promised to your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this is how you should live in view of God's graciousness to you. So I'm going to give you four words by which I have divided up this fairly lengthy book, 36 chapters, but... Uh, again, just to make it easier, we're going to begin with dynasty, then division, then death, and then decree. So we'll see, first of all, that beginning in chapter 1, verse 1, that the dynasty continues. We're told here that Solomon, the son of David, established himself in his kingdom and the Lord his God was with him and made him exceedingly great. And so just as God had promised, even reaching all the way back to Abraham, but certainly in this promise, this covenant he makes with David, there is this promise to bless this descendant and to be present with him. And so we see here at the beginning of this reign of Solomon, and as we continue our Route 66, we're, we're going to see some of the ways that really ultimately Solomon admits that he failed as a man, as a follower of Yahweh God, as, as a king. But there are, because of God's covenant with David to be faithful to this descendant, God prospered the king Solomon. Notice here that in worship, Solomon acknowledges this great truth. Look at verse 8. And Solomon said to God, You have shown great and steadfast love to David my father and have made me king in his place. So Solomon recognizes it. it's not because of something innate within me. It is because of that which you have promised, beginning with my father, David. It is because of your faithfulness, first and fundamentally, to yourself, to do that which you have promised. Now, here's a word or a phrase that you can underline. You see in verse 8, steadfast love. Now, some of you know this because I've said it many, many times. But that is a translation of a single Hebrew word, and you need to remember this, okay? This is a good word to remember. It looks like in English the word hesed, H-E-S-E-D. 
Hesed. I think per, appropriately is pronounced Kesed. Okay, and it is a word that sums up the unique covenantal faithfulness of God to His people. That God has bound Himself to His people and to be their protector, their savior, forever. And so it's a very unique concept found in the Old Testament. And so Solomon recognizes God's faithfulness uh, to, to him. And so Solomon makes this request that he would have wisdom to rule and to lead. Now the truth is, he was a wise man, but he didn't always live and rule wisely. And tragically, the seeds for the destruction of the nation were sown and nurtured and fertilized during the reign of this man, Solomon. And so he prays for wisdom, and God grants that, and he grants to him incredible wealth. If you look down there at verse 14, we're told that Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen, 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Now, once again, we should be reminded of that which the nation was warned about in Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 17, that these kings should not take many wives, that they should not gather to themselves great wealth, they should not accumulate for themselves a great military, and on and on it goes. And so we see this what? that Solomon is going to disregard the word of the Lord, and it's going to be troubling to him and to the nation. Notice here in verse 15, the king made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stone. In other words, they were prospered, just as God said he would prosper. A phrase caught my attention early this morning as I was kind of putting the finishing touches on uh, the sermon and going over it in my mind and praying over the sermon. There at the end of verse 15 it says, He made cedar as plentiful as the sycamore. That's kind of an interesting phrase. We don't think much about that. But again, given my background and having worked a little bit with cedar, in fact, uh, some of the most expensive houses that my dad ever built while I was working with him were that we utilized what was called cedar shakes on the roof. That that was just a, a, a very uh, expensive way of roofing a house and because of the excellence of the wood, some of its natural characteristics, it was great to use for roofing and for siding. And it stood in contrast to sycamore which really wasn't worth much. It really wasn't very good to do anything other than just to burn it, okay? And so not only was silver and gold common, but the best of building materials was available and readily available there within the nation because what? God was fulfilling his promise to bless these, his people, these descendants of Abraham. And so in chapters 2 through 4, we see uh, this very lengthy, in fact, it really covers about six chapters, but it covers the building of the temple. And I think that the ancient Jew would have thought of Solomon's greatest accomplishment as that of the building of this temple. And the temple was very much a, vi a physical sign, a physical symbol, a physical testimony to God's presence and therefore his approval among his people. In fact, it looks forward to and beyond this great reality. If you'll remember, Jesus said of himself of the temple that would stand in his day, which was in a sense the third temple, he said, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. And then there's an aside in, gospel, in the Gospel of John's account of this. He said he was referring to his body. He was referring to his demise in the grave and his resurrection from the dead as truly the temple, the dwelling place 
of God. And then we're told in the book of Revelation, as our final estate is described, this heavenly Jerusalem, there was no need for any temple because the Lamb and God Almighty was His temple. And so, in some very real sense, these physical structures are only temporary, but they do point forward to the ultimate reality, namely the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I've seen some substantial building projects uh, in my time, and we're told in chapter 2 that they utilized 183,000 workers. Now, I don't know how many of you have managed people before, but anytime you manage more than yourself, you're asking for problems, okay? And, and so uh, I can't imagine. Can, some of you guys that kind of work in the trades, you know, say, okay, Monday morning. All right, let's get those 183,000 people out here on time. We're going to have to te teach them how to lay a stone on a foundation again. Start, it's been a long weekend, so here we go again. I don't know how in the world you organize 183,000 people. Now, certainly that's across the entirety of the nation, even internationally, as they gathered materials and so forth and so on. But that's an incredible workforce to build a building that had about 10% of the square footage that this facility here has. It was about a 3,500 square foot building, and we've got 33,000 square feet here. So it wasn't really that big of a building, a little over 100 feet long, a little over 30 feet wide. So not, not a tremendous building, but an impressive building because, again, it was the place that God had said, I will dwell among you, my people. Eventually, we're told that the ark is brought to the temple. Again, a second indicator of God's blessing, of God's approval, of God's presence. Now, I guess this is a good place to say this, because sometimes you're thinking, well, boy, I'd like to live in Solomon's day so I can have some of that silver and gold. That's what I'd like. I want those blessings under the old covenant. The great presence of God guaranteed to every believer under the new covenant is far better than anything that typified and foreshadowed it under the old covenant. That God is present with us, He has tabernacled among us, and He will never leave us or forsake us. And so the ark is brought, and we see this, this great visual display that's described as a cloud. And it reaches all the way back to the Exodus, when God led that nation out of Egypt by the cloud by the day and the pillar of fire uh, by night. And so uh, it surrounded, it envelops the entirety of that complex. And it reminds us that as Moses ascended Mount Sinai to receive the law, we're told that the top of that mountain was shrouded in a deep, dark cloud. And again, it was a very foreboding presence of God among them. So we see that the ark is brought and it's going to be placed there in uh, the temple. We see the, the great promises beginning in chapter 6. What I call covenantal uh, promises and uh, the reflecting of God's commitment that he began uh, way back with Abraham recorded in Genesis chapter 12 of progeny, of property, of prosperity, of protection and presence. We see there also in chapter 6 a great prayer of dedication uh, for that temple that, that indeed Solomon was appropriately humbled by the privilege that he had enjoyed of doing that which his father David had greatly desired to do. But he was the one chosen by God to build this temple. In verse 18 of chapter 6, this is something of a rhetorical questions, a, a device uh, to cause the original readers to think, to cause us to think. But will God indeed dwell with man on earth? I could leave you with that for a while. If you'd really think about it and really contemplate the greatness of God. Now, 
remember this. God's purpose in creation was what? To have a people among whom he would dwell. That's what went on in the Garden of Eden, if you'll remember that. And then sin separated us. And so to God's great to a great testimony of God's grace, by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, God has a people among whom he dwells. Okay? Doesn't need buildings. He chooses to what? Dwell among his people. And the church is rightly remembered and rightly thought of as indeed the temple of God. Now, the most well-known section of the book is found in chapter 7. If you want to turn there and if you begin reading in verse 11, you will recognize this prayer, this, this word from God. And you might make a note if you want to do it this way. Uh, the prescription for God's favor. The prescription for God's favor. And it's God's word to Solomon and the instruction that God's people must seek his face. The people that were going to go into exile, they were told by the prophet Jeremiah, this is God's word to you. You will find me when you seek for me with all your heart. Okay? And so, uh, God's people are by definition seekers of God. To, to seek to know Him fully, to experience all of His grace and its dramatic power. And so, we see that... Now, we see this aspect of promise. And I'm, I'm going to get in trouble here today. You know I do that occasionally. But look at verse 14. I've seen these verses on bumper stickers and on placards and uh, time and around the National Day of Prayer. We see these things uh, published. Uh, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, I've said this a number of times. I want you all to, to be sure you understand this. That was a promise made in the context of the Old Covenant to the Theocratic Kingdom. We're not under the Old Covenant, and we're not citizens of the Theocratic Kingdom. Okay? Now, I think there are principles there that are important for us to recognize. I'm not saying it's irrelevant. But we also need to recognize, as we'll see toward the end of the book, after a great period of apostasy, Josiah is at the center, the King Josiah, of a great revival. And I believe that God's people, if, since it's called a great revival, they were praying for their nation. But yet God had determined because of their sin that they were going to be punished. So I don't know how you put all that together exactly, okay? Now, kind of the point of application. If anyone is going to pray for their nation, it's going to be those who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And we should, and we must, but be careful about making some kind of unilateral application of that which was associated with the theocratic kingdom. Indeed, please don't leave here today. Well, Brother Tim said, don't ever, don't ever pray, pray for our nation. Pray for your nation. But be careful, this is not really so much a promise that guarantees that God is going to heal the United States of America because we're not uniquely in a covenant with him as the nation of Israel was. Now, to be sure, you need to pray for your nation. Drew sent me something last night or this morning. The President of the United States of America has signed a proclamation that today is Transgender Day of Visibility. Now that's been around for a while. He just happens to be the first president to make an official proclamation related to that. 
here on the day that Christians throughout the world are celebrating the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ, his resurrection from his, the dead, his victory over sin for us, the president of this country thinks it's a great day that we celebrate the perverse and their perversion. You do need to pray for America. Let me tell you this. You think, well, that's, you know, that's 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. There's, you know, the old guy up there. We've mentioned this a couple of times. Drew and I went to a meeting at the Trustful Public Library first of this month. Now, this is happening all across the state. and It's happening all across the country. But there are people that were disturbed that books that were defining, describing, and advocating certain types of perversity, and they were written for, they were designed for children. These books were placed in the children's area, and some Christians objected. And so we went to the meeting to just see what, what was going to be said. And right here in Red State, Alabama, presumably Red City, Trustful, Alabama, we were at least in a two-to-one minority. That the only people that spoke were those that thought, think it is the greatest thing in the world to have these books in their public library. And every one of them that spoke got a round of applause and cheers from the people in the room. And so... Is here. Albert Moeller, in writing about this years ago, and he said it many times on his podcast, there's not going to be anywhere to hide people. And so I say that simply to emphasize the necessity that we pray. Now, some of y'all get a little agitated when you, know, you think I'm politicking and blah, blah, blah. But hear this. It's not original to me. Politics is downstream from culture. And culture is downstream from worldview. And worldview is downstream from foundational presuppositions, assumptions, etc. And these foundational presuppositions must be founded on something. Our issue in this day is not just the presuppositions and the worldview, et cetera, and the politics. It is the foundation for all right thinking. The foundation for human flourishing has been eradicated from this society. And so, again, the principle is this. Pray for your nation. And pray for all nations. Well, after the death of Solomon, again, which... Solomon's career takes up nine chapters in the book. We come to the point in which the kingdom of Israel is going to divide into northern and southern kingdoms. Again, that decline that I mentioned really began under the reign of Solomon. It's going to be actuated as his son, Rehoboam, takes the throne, and he is opposed by a man by the name of Jeroboam. And so... Uh, the kingdom divides because unlike his father, Rehoboam does not exercise wisdom in the course of his leadership over the nation. Um, so when it advised that the people are discontented, uh, they've had a difficult time under your father Solomon, uh, uh, his excesses, uh, brought great suffering to the nation at large. And so maybe it's time to give the people some relief. And so Rehoboam said this, My little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. He, I will give to them a heavier yoke. I will add to your troubles. He disciplined with whips. I will discipline with scorpions. In other words, you think times, times were tough under my dad? Just watch. You need to suck it up because here I come. Things are going to get tougher because, again, I am tougher 
than my dad. Well, what happened? Well, the nation divided. In chapter 12, verse 1, we see these tragic words regarding Rehoboam. When the rule of Rehoboam was established and he was strong, he abandoned the law of the Lord. And so once, again, to, to abandon the law of the Lord is essentially to abandon the Lord. Okay, It is to reject God's wisdom and God's authority. And so it, it really set the nation on what amounts to 300 years of decline, of wicked kings, of moral and political and economic decline. And so the nation persisted in this decline. Oh, yes, indeed, there was the occasional good king. I mentioned earlier that one of the Davidic kings was a man by the name of Josiah. If you'll turn forward very quickly to chapter 34, we will see the uh, description of his reign following the disastrous reign of his grandfather and even worse reign of his father. We're told that Josiah comes to the throne at eight years old. Now, I'm perfectly willing to baptize some eight-year-olds, but I don't want any of them to be king, okay? But Josiah ascended to the throne, and we're told that he reigned for 31 years, and we see that positive assessment of him in verse 2. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of David. Now remember, David wasn't perfect. But the overall trajectory of his life was that he would honor God, that he would obey the law of God. When he broke the law of God, remember what we said about him. What did he do? He repented. He repented. And so what did Josiah discover? Well, what we see during his lifetime is a description of revival. Remember we talked about a pre prescription of God's favor or revival. Here we see the description of of revival. And first of all, Josiah sought God. He opposed the enemies of God, and he sought to restore the worship of God, and it was centered around the very Word of God. If you look at verse 14 of chapter 34, we're told as they're working there within the temple, in verse 15, we hear the testimony of Hilkiah. I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Whether I speak to you personally, whether I speak to you corporately, whether I speak to the, the church at large, or the church in general, there will be little accomplished in your life. There will be little accomplished for the cause of Christ divorced from the Word of God. God uses His Word. He uses His Word to break people, to expose their sin, to provoke repentance. He uses His Word because it is the imperishable seed of the new birth to bring individuals to conversion. I've thrown a word around since I arrived here that we want to be a word-centered church. Now, that's not the same as being preacher-centered. I don't want you to be preacher-centered. I want you to be word-centered. And we preach the written word for the sake of the testimony to the incarnate word. Okay? The purpose of God's word we see here they discovered the law. What does the law do? It causes us to realize we are guilty of our sin and that we need a Savior. And there's only one Savior, and His name is Jesus. And so we see that this Word, that the finding of the Word brought about revival. And again, I believe that the church is healthy, that it is strengthened when the Word is rightly proclaimed. Now, I'll get in trouble again. I know it. So I think I've already gotten there once or twice today. So let's go there again. Now, I'm sure 
somewhere in the course of today, I'll hear about some church's great pageant or program or play. Oh, it's just so great, and you know, I got goosebumps, and yada, 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 yada. And that's fine, in some sense. But if it crowds out the proclamation, the verbal proclamation of the Word of God, they're doing a disservice to God and His people. Because God has ordained, God has determined that He will be found by the proclamation of His Word. And that's why, again, I keep using this term, we will be a Word-centered church. And again, uh, the nation was revived during uh, this time of Josiah, but tragically, upon his death, the nation would descend once again into its apostasy. You know, it's kind of true. When we have a bad king... We long for a good king. And when we have a good king, we long for a permanent king. And the problem with Josiah, he was a good king, but he wasn't a permanent king. The problem with most of the kings, they were bad kings, and they hung around simply too long. But here's the thing. All of those bad kings and good kings point us forward to our king whose name is Jesus Christ, who is the perfect king. Well, let's, let's consider here very quickly the death of Judah. This is the depiction of the rejection of God, the curse applied to the nation as promised. And we see the listing of the four kings who would rule successively in Jerusalem as the Babylonians came to destroy the city destroy the temple, loot it, and take its leading citizens to Babylon. Most of you are familiar with the story of Daniel and his three friends. But this, it's in this time frame, probably early in the time frame, probably 605 B.C., that Daniel was taken into captivity in Babylon. And so this was a terrible, and it was a devastating time, and it was exactly what God promised. Remember, under the Old Covenant, blessings and cursings. I hold before you life and death. And they chose death. They chose the way of rebellion. And so they went into this great 70-year exile outside of the land. And so that brings us to the final thing this morning. This decree of Cyrus that I read in my opening. That is, that the nation had died. They were buried in Babylon. And God did what? He raised them from the dead. Do we know anyone else that has ever been raised from the dead? The whole pattern of the history of the nation of Israel points us forward to that which we celebrate today. Again, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. The, the late Harry Reader used to talk about takeaways as he concluded his sermons. And so here's some Resurrection Sunday takeaways from the book of Second Chronicles. You see, this, this return didn't look like much. It wasn't very glorious. The, the temple wasn't very impressive the people weren't powerful, and they weren't wealthy. But God brought them back for a purpose. He brought them back because of a, a promise, a promise that goes all the way back to the opening chapters of the Bible. The promise when he said that there shall be a seed of the woman who shall be, shall be struck on the heel, shall be bruised on the heel by the seed of the serpent, but in return, he shall crush the head of that serpent. That promise runs all the way through the entirety of the Bible. The nation was raised from the dead, so to speak, brought back to live there in Jerusalem for the sake of their preservation so that 
Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, the, the eternal King, the one in whom all the promises of God are amen, the one who fulfilled the law, who a- accomplished its very purpose and died experiencing its penalties for us. And so, all of this, you may not see it, it may just be in the shadows, but all of this points us forward to the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. They come back to the land. What do they do? They build a temple. They build a temple. Again, not particularly spectacular, but it was a step of their faith that God would do what? He would honor His promise. And so God is the faithful one as His Son laid down His life to take it up again for the sake of the salvation of His sheep. In fact, I... Really, in in summary, and I remember saying this several times as we did these devotions from these historical books, the presence of these bad kings, and they were bad, the presence of these bad kings reminds us that what we need is a perfect king. And our perfect king has come. He has come, and he, where the nation suffered God's curse, death, Jesus, our king, did what? He suffered the curse of death for us. And his resurrection is what? The testimony that I have defeated death for you. And so he has ascended the, as I said in my opening, the tomb is empty. But the throne is occupied by one whose name is King Jesus. And he is the one we celebrate today. And he is the one that all these good kings, bad kings, he is the one that they point forward to. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your grace, for the testimony to your son, our great and victorious king. The king that you promised all the way back in the Garden of Eden, that he would be the seed of the woman. He would be the child of Abraham. He would be the lion of the tribe of Judah. He would be the eternal king that would descend from his father, David, to establish an eternal kingdom. And he would rule and reign forever in victory. And for that, We give thanks on this, this Sunday, in which we pay particular attention, in which we celebrate the resurrection of our King and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.